Hello again, Ian. Uh, hello, Alex. Good to see you. Yes, as always, great to see you. We're going to be covering chapter 27, Purpose, Life, and the Nature of the Cosmos. A brief chapter compared to the length of some of others, some of the others. Nevertheless, yes. you're writing about the nature of the cosmos, so it's not a light topic, let's say. No, in a way, it sort of leads us in towards the last chapter, which is a, a much longer, more difficult chapter. Um, but yes, I wanted to, it seemed to me to, to do a couple of things, really, to bridge from values, which was the last chapter, to this sense of there being deep meaning in the, in the universe. How would that be if there was absolutely no discernible purpose anywhere in the cosmos? Um, and I, I, I wanted to suggest that purpose is another kind of expression of value, really, that it is another adverb for the process of consciousness and life, that it is purposefully doing what it is doing. Mm -hmm. It is purposefully leading towards some place. Um, and this is something that um, is officially uh, absolutely taboo to mainstream science, but has become very difficult to conceal in the last hundred years, particularly with advances in physics, but also in biology. And famously, J.B.S. Haldane, great biologist said, um, I hope I'll get it right, purpose is the mistress that the scientist cannot live without, but whom he's unwilling to be seen with in public. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you talk to scientists off the record, they go, well, of course, there have to be purposes. Uh, it's clear. But um, I wanted really to elaborate on what is meant by purpose and why it's an important concept. Yes. So you talk about purpose, talk seriously about it, defend that this int intrinsic and that not only it is intrinsic to, we could say, our own minds, but it's intrinsic to the fabric of reality. So it's purpose yes. taken very seriously here. Yes, yes, Probably it as is. Serious, as serious as one can, can consider it. Yes, I suppose so. I mean, I, I'm, whatever else, I suppose, I'm not frightened of, of taking difficult concepts, unfashionable concepts seriously, if, they're, if they seem to me to have importance and um, to contribute to our understanding. Mm. I think to uh, dogmatically declare there can be no purposes runs counter to, um, well, it runs counter to observation, really. I mean, at the simplest level, anyone who has spent time as a naturalist observing the natural world, even if it's just looking at pond life, under a microscope mm -hmm. and so on, or, or looking at um, white blood vessel, vessels at work in the bloodstream, can see purposive action going on here. And, and right now, I'm just, I, I, I'm unfortunately very um, taken up with other things at the moment, but I'm also reading with enormous pleasure Jude Caravan's uh, new book, Gaia, about um, the living world and about the, the way in which it is complex and, and purposeful. And I'm finding it very interesting um, about the inanimate world, how, how extraordinarily um, purposeful it looks. In a way, you, you really have a choice of either saying there can be no purpose, uh, but I agree, it looks very purposeful, but it only looks very purposeful because we happen to be here watching it. And we're here because this is the only universe that looks like this. But this takes us back to the profligacy of the idea that we can 
say, well, there just must be a, an infinite number of universes. And in an infinite number of universes, sooner or later, this universe will happen, not just once, unfortunately, but an infinite number of times. So, but in a way, that is a non-argument, because it's really uh, defaulting on the ability to resolve this in any reasonable way. It's rather like saying, well, I can't ans answer this, I can't argue it, but I'm just going to say, because it has happened, it must happen because there are an infinite number of universes. The difficulty with that gambit is it then stops one being able to say anything in science is truer than anything else. Because if there's an infinite number of universes, then things are, um, all things are true or not true, depending on which universe you happen to be in at the time. Yes. But in this one, there definitely does seem to be purpose. But I think we can cut through a lot of the trouble with this by making some distinctions about what I mean by purpose. And the first and most important one is distinguishing between what I call extrinsic purpose and intrinsic purpose. So a tool or a machine, such as a photocopier, is built by an engineer so that it can carry out an extrinsic purpose, not the purpose of the machine in itself. It can't have a purpose for itself, but the purpose for the operator, the maker. And of course, this is imaged in a certain cosmology where God is seen as a divine engineer who created the cosmos in a certain way, wound it up, and um, perhaps occasionally supervises it by oiling the machinery or tinkering with things slightly. But this is, in fact, a mechanism for his purposes. Yes. And that is an idea I cannot accept uh, on any any level. <laughs> And I think it's it's part of the left hemisphere's mindset, just as the meaningless, uh, purposeless universe is. They're both misunderstandings of what purpose might be, i.e. intrinsic purpose. And the left hemisphere only understands extrinsic purposes. What is this for? It's for cutting, it's for slicing, it's for killing, it's for chopping, it's for building or whatever. It's the, it's the tool maker, the machine maker. So. That's the first, and it's contrasting really a machine or a mechanism or a tool with something like a dance or a poem, which is not pointless or purposeless, but it doesn't have an extrinsic purpose. It's not that you dance a dance in order that something may happen. The dance is fulfilled in itself by being a dance. The poem is fulfilled in itself by being a poem. Mm. So these are, these are the kinds of purposes I'm talking about. Let me pause you there to say more about yes. intr intrinsic because um, one yes. can think of intrinsic as to inside the entity we're talking about, and I'm thinking about cybernetics and what it okay. did. What it did in order to upgrade, say, the software of behaviorism, but at the same time we got all these gadgets with closed loops and inner references set by the engineer, but nevertheless, then when led to its own doings, machines as they may be, well, would behave as if they had purposes. And th so that would be one stage, kind of an upgrade. But of course, as I think Hans Jonas critiques in a brilliant essay on purpose, a critique on cybernetics, something like that. I cannot remember the, the, the title now. But so uh, uh, let's say a thermostat, no matter how complicated, can never be a horse in terms of the the goals that the horse may have. But now, as you're saying intrinsic, again, it sounds to me that you're saying even more than that, even more than uh, an organism, an animal is not a machine because the reference points in cybernetics term terms are inside them, they come from from from, it, from that being, but also intrinsic, as you were saying, it, it, it fulfills in itself. It, it's not externally subjected or fulfilled from this. So I, I'm just saying this, in, 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 in order to make explicit that there can be gradations, not to go continuously, but as what we understand by purpose being intrinsic mm -hmm. and from weaker mm -hmm. notions to, again, to a very strong notion, as you're saying, a poem could be, could be at this further edge of the spectrum. Yes, it's a good point. Um, I think what I'd say is that in the case of a computer or a cybernetic um, network construct, um, the purpose 
you cannot get away from the fact that some person built this for a purpose, even if that purpose is that this computer should explore internally some random things. But the computer is not, as it were, purposeful in its decisions about what to do. It's programmed, even if the programming the, the immediate, the proximate programming is somehow internal. The ultimate program is something inserted into the machine or into the network. So it, there is always another person's consciousness and another person's purpose um, somehow behind it. Um, and if there is no person, then that becomes, according to a certain fundamentalist way of thinking, God. God is the engineer. But I'm arguing against God as an engineer. I, I will talk more about what everyone means about God, but one thing one doesn't mean by God, in my view, is is an engineer. Um, that, that is just an expression, an outward projection of the left hemisphere's fantasy of omnipotence and omniscience. Let me say I'm in the image of a God that knows everything and can do everything. But um, th th that, of course, is not how the right hemisphere sees things. Uh, so I think there is a distinction to be made then between things that are fulfilling in themselves, uh, not obscurely in order to achieve a particular goal. Because the computer, even if it sets itself a goal internally, is still setting itself a goal. It's really the goal is this, and we're going to go there. Um, and that's what the program is about. But when we dance, we don't set ourselves a goal. Even if it's just to complete this dance, we just enter the dance and we are dancing and we are fulfilled in dancing. And that doesn't mean to say we'd be fulfilled in anything. I mean, um, standing naked on one leg in, in a howling gale um, is something I could do, uh, but it wouldn't be fulfilling to me in the way that being caught up in something that has meaning in itself, like a dance, mm. does. It's about meaning, really. Mm, yes, and now I understand better the remark you made at the beginning uh, as to the bridge between values and this deeper meaning through through purpose. Thank you. Now it's clear. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, and and of course, in any case, whichever kind of purpose one's talking about, and and I'm only concerned with what I call intrinsic purpose. I. I think, I think maybe just, sorry, let me just say that again. I mean, let's start with um, James Cass's distinction between finite games and infinite games. So an infinite game is one that is played for the sake of the playing. A finite game is a game that's played for the goal of winning. So there's a goal, there is an outcome, and when it's achieved, that's the end of the game. But there is another kind of game, if you like to think of life in terms of games, that is fulfilled simply by the process of living. So the, the question is, are there purposes in life that are over, overall, one might say the purpose of life is to be lived, Immediately, though, one can have um, narrow instrumental purposes. So um, an example from the physicist Andrew Steen, writing about this issue, says, what is the purpose of a lioness when she's on the prowl, hungry? Her purpose is to kill and to eat. Or, or, or is it to pass on lioness genes? Mm, yes. doesn't sound very, very good either. Um, is it just to be the best a lioness can be and he says well nearly and and his bet and mine is that the purpose of a lioness is the, for the cosmos to express something potential in it and to bring it into being as an enrichment of that cosmos so it's part of this idea of an unfolding yes. of the implicate into the explicate yes. so it, it, it illustrates um the, the the idiosyncrasy the hexietas of that um being and fulfills itself by being a lioness. Um, so, so the same, so that we can, there can be purposes in nature which are short term and instrumental within an overall purpose, which is a purpose that I call the intrinsic purpose. That's not to fulfill a specifiable goal, but to be uh, what it is. And then, of course, you could distinguish between um, purposes which are narrowly controlled and purposes that are open. 
I think this is pretty important because the idea of a purpose to many people means, well, that means determinism. But it doesn't necessarily because there are many things that can be um, purposes, but there is no way of narrowly determining them. Nonetheless, one's disposition towards them makes a difference. So I give the example of somebody who wants to get married. That may be a purpose. But exactly when and with whom is completely obscure. I mean, it can't be known ahead of time at all. So you can't go to that person and that place and start to become their partner. You have to wait for chance. Mm. But chance is something that purpose can work with. Randomness mm. and unpredictability are part of the stuff of purpose, something that purpose can harness. Mm. And, and this is true at the genetic level, so that when there is a crisis, in an organism, it can accelerate the rate of mutation at a certain point in the genome up to a million times, because it, it knows that this part of the genome needs to come up with something new rapidly. And the way to do that is to accelerate mutations, which are random, but the choice of the locus is not random. And the outcome is not random, the outcome for the organism is something that it can select from randomness. So th there's this interplay between what is um, apparently unspecifiable and yet a purpose. And so w w when you look around um, at the, the world, um, all kinds of unspecifiable things uh, can be predicted in a way. Uh, Take the example of the number of dog bites in Britain. Every year there are 17 to 18,000 dog bites that are reported. Um, at, um, but um, no individual dog on any one day can be predicted. Uh, no bite can be predicted, but the results are consistent. And equally, it can be the other way around. So I think I've already quoted the astonishing fact that uncertainty comes into not just the um, uh, subatomic sphere, but into everyday life, so that even the ricochets of billiard balls cannot be calculated accurately, entirely accurately mm -hmm. after about eight collisions. After that, a degree of uncertainty mm -hmm. comes into it. So things that look very certain at the small level may be uncertain at a higher level and vice versa. Yeah, so for you, for, for purpose to be a real purpose, it, it requires a degree of freedom, right? You express it in this way. There's something about it that needs to yes. inject some some freedom. Of course, now uh, intellect may protest and say, well, what are you talking about? What kind of freedom is being injected there and to what extent? And that's, I guess, when you, the notion of scale, which is the third aspect you you outlay at the beginning yes. can help us understand yes. that one can have uncertainty or freedom at one level, uh, but at the, at, on another level, the purpose can be very, very clear and fixed. Yes. Okay. So help me, help me sp spell these thoughts out. Mm. Um, yes, yes. Um, I don't think one needs to inject freedom into the situation because, of course, that is, to my way of thinking, the wrong way around. Um, it's not that things are constrained and deterministic, and so how does one get any freedom into this? Um, my view is that things are not constrained and deterministic, but nonetheless, um, meaningful patterns emerge. So uh, what, what is probably worth referring to here is an idea of um, Conrad Hal Waddington, the 20th century biologist, who talked about creodes, which are sort of preferential pathways. And, and the best way to think of this is of water falling on a landscape. And it, it's a hilly landscape with valleys that run down to the sea. And the water falls in an unpatterned way across the landscape randomly. But the outcome is not random because the water will tend to flow into certain channels and then into rivulets and then into streams and rivers until it meets the sea. And you can predict that this water will emerge into the sea at perhaps one of two places or even exactly where it will come out into the sea. Yes. So 
And that idea is, is a good one because it suggests that there's a sort of stored energy in the landscape which directs things that are themselves free towards certain aims or ends. Mm. And I think that's a rather useful one in biology. Obviously, he was thinking of it in terms of biology. Mm. I mean, if, if you look at the puzzling fact that if Simon Conway Morris is right, uh, I think it, it, it's now 14 times we believe that over the evolution of life, the eye has been um, invented separately. Now, for the eye to come about by chance, even once, is an amazing feat because it's very complicated and it only works if quite a number of factors are brought together. Mm. But what this suggests is that some outcomes are very, very important and having an eye of some kind is terribly important. And so, through the randomness of different um, branches of the evolutionary tree, this end has nonetheless come about 14 times. I think that's, a, that's another way of looking at it. In, yeah. in this genius image, and there's this paradigmatic drawing that you also include in the chapter of Waddington landscape. Yes. It, it's, it's great. At the same time, <clears throat> there's something missing, which I think you also mentioned, because this rolling ball um, otherwise may seem too deterministic or too passive, even invoking too passive. deterministic chaos and the fact that you may literally um, drop many rolling balls and they may end up distributing. But there's something about, can I say, the agency of yes. the rolling ball that also plays a role. Is, is there yes. is, is that the degree of freedom um, intrinsic yes. to the rolling ball, you can speak about it? Well, I think it is, and it's a good point to make, that it's not always that everything will follow this precise uh, deterministic landscape, because if there is enough force and energy and enough water falling, it may overflow one channel and go somewhere else altogether. So the landscape is, is shaping, it's not narrowly restricting. Mm. So once again, it's this matter of tendencies towards certain mm. outcomes, tendencies towards certain forms, mm. but that nothing anywhere in this is deterministic in the simple sense. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, all that one can say is that there are preferential outcomes for yes. freely acting entities, which might be atoms or they might be people. I mean, of course, human freedoms are, uh, I'm sure anyone who's got this far in following us doesn't think that I believe that we're blank slates or anything like that. Of course not. I mean, w w the determinants of our actions are many and, and uh, um, some of them are inherited and some of them are environmental and so on and so forth. So that's got nothing whatever to do with what I'm saying. But nonetheless, we need to be able to balance these things together. And, and what is extraordinary to um, a lot of people is that it was Darwin himself who particularly liked the idea of teleology. Teleology just really means having an end in sight, having a purpose, because yeah. uh, most people's um, perhaps rather naive understanding is that Darwin was simply saying it's all, it's all random, but it isn't. Um, and he, he said that, um, and so did T.H. Huxley, who was known as Darwin's bulldog, that the great thing that he had achieved was bringing together teleology with morphology so that neither of them was excluded. In other words, the forms that things take further certain purposes. Yes, you, you quote also Darwin's son, right, and also one of Francis persons, Darwin, yes. whose name I can't remember who was really admired by Darwin's in terms of understanding his own thought. And Asa, in a way, Asa, Asa, Asa Gray. Yes, yes. So, so this is the, the, story. the American, American botanist Asa Gray. Yes, yes. This is a lovely part of this chapter. I can remember the page where you, you know, introduced <laughs> these, these three very close men to, to Darwin intellectually yes. and how they all, and Darwin himself, um, portrayed a picture of Darwinism that's that's nowhere to be found in how it's taught today. No, it's that's the suppressed, right. That's... It's the suppressed story of Darwinism itself. 
Yes, yes, that's absolutely right. And how dis disappointed Darwin would be that that's been missed out of the picture, because Asa Gray was a very great botanist and uh, well known in his own right, and he, they corresponded. And I think in the 1860s, was it 1868 or somewhere around then, uh, Asa Gray wrote a, um, an appreciation of Darwin for Nature, which was already an existent journal then. and. Um, and Darwin wrote uh, expressing his great thanks and saying, above all, what I'm grateful for, and it has not been enough noticed, is that what I'm doing is bringing together teleology with morphology, and it took you to see this. And he then, uh, well, not then, but on another occasion, he, he, he wrote to somebody, um, Asa Gray is the man. If, if I ever don't know quite what it is I mean, I will ask Asa Gray. He was always there before I am. <laughs> But, but as you say, so there's Asa Gray, there's T.H. Huxley, and there's Francis Darwin, Darwin's son, all making this point that it is the coming together of teleology with morphology. Now, with that in mind, do we still have to go through this charade that there is no teleology in nature? This ridiculous thing that you can't say a turtle comes on shore to lay her eggs, mm. but the turtle comes on shore and lays her eggs. So yeah. these are um, coincidences. Well, uh, left brain um, analysis <laughs> of why that is, and also a, a, even a kind of a psychoanalytical story of the disdain for final causes, and of course the confusion um, that the alternative to this mechanistic push is some sort of finalistic pull. I mean, all of that is combined and creates this, this confusion whereby, as, as we speak, most biologists would only recognize effective causes as what's driving the business of the cosmos and all the rest. Mm. Let's still not talk mm. about it. Um, maybe you can mm. say more about where you think that that utter repulsion for entertaining the idea that there's there are purposes around, which is obvious, right? Where, where is this coming from? And, and also how to, mm. how, to, how to edit it a bit, erase it, change it, in, in what ways? Mm. Mm. Could be difficult, I think, but I, I think the process is already beginning. Um, I think people are much more open to the idea that there are selective, there are selections, there are choices, there are drives in living creatures, and that they don't, they're not just bombarded passively with events which then mold their future. And I thought it was nice that you said, um, you know, that a final cause doesn't have to be a, I mean, it's often thought of as a, a sort of deterministic one, but it may not be. So, for example, there may be a drive towards the development of an eye, which is a kind of, you know, drawn from in front process rather than just propelled from behind. But nonetheless, what that creature will be like, it may be of many kinds. In fact, it's of at least 14 different kinds and then their offspring. So um, it, it, there's always a dialogue, and I think we keep coming back to this, a reciprocity uh, between um, the deterministic view and the non-deterministic view. And it's not that we need um, <laughs> just one or the other but <laughs> how many times do i need to make these points many but we need many 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 <laughs> because they're so hard for people to grasp or, or, or to take on board is that we need in in this story there are elements where at times things are pushed and determined either from in front or, or pulled from in front or pushed from behind but there are also uh, elements which are entirely un um constrained or almost entirely unconstrained i say almost entirely unconstrained because I believe that randomness is not ultimately achievable. There will always be influences in any process in the universe. But uh, what I'm really saying is that the we don't have to be the, the espousers of one or other of these ways of thinking. We need to think flexibly. Mm -hmm. And I think nature acts flexibly in this way. Sometimes using randomness to achieve an end and sometimes following a path yes that's well yes, trodden indeed. it is hard to escape from this axis when the axis from either deterministic yes. or random and, and here you're presenting yes. a, 
if I can make the mathematical analogy, a landscape with more dimensions just to understand to understand the nature yes. of the cosmos. And sometimes you draw from this end of this of the line, sometimes from the other, but there there are other dimensions um, that are all yes. There needs to be a sort of symbiosis of ideas to mm. borrow a biological image. Anyway, now, from from, yes. from, a, from an Eastern some Eastern cosmologies or cosmogonies, mm. um, desire mm. would be another. I was thinking of this. Desire would be another way to talk about mm. purpose, and and it would yes, be totally yes. normal to say that the seed mm. strives or desires or wants to become a flower mm. or a tree. Right. Mm. Nevertheless, we need mm. to say it with a small mouth. If we're talking as scientists, like, well, what do you mean? Even, even all the many, even all the many very interesting talks, lectures about evolution, you constantly hear the, the you know, the, the the warning, the caveat. Well, I'm speaking as if, but just you know, as if evolution wanted. And of course, one needs to be precise. But there is this still this ca caution in in not anthropomorphizing, mm. but at the end of the day, mm. and we discuss mm. this. And um, what ends up happening if we speak as if purposes weren't real is that it's a weird kind of um, left brain anthropomorphization of, of the story, which is what we wanted to avoid. Or what we say we're avoiding, we make all these caveats in our, in our description. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, and I think when in talking about chapter 12, um, we must have discussed the, the difference between the language which biologists use and their professed philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and that this doesn't exist for physicists in the same way. Mm -hmm. So the, there does seem to be a huge discrepancy, and they're always saying, yes, but I'm only speaking figuratively. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mind, mind, mind you, one has to accept that to talk about these things at all is, is difficult, and um, it may be that we're, we're hamstrung by using only language which comes from uh, human uh, decision making and so yeah. forth, but uh, but it, we, should, we should be open to the possibility that this is revealing some truth about what is happening here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, one of the reasons to to think it might be is the sheer improbability of any of these things happening without there being some directive purpose. I mean, in in a way, I mean, what life is constantly doing is speeding up things that are very important to it. Mm. So um, I, I think that um, I'm right in saying that um, that many reactions that are taking place at the rate of a thousandth of a second in a mm. cell mm. would take up to half a million years to happen without the presence of an enzyme, which is very important to making yes. them happen. Yes. Yes. So the, the circumstances are constantly being tailored in order that these things should be able to move in the direction that is desired. And uh, I, I know that it, it, it's, um, but the case I find so fascinating is, well, Lee Smolin and Eugene Koonin. Um, Lee Smolin is not frightened of the idea that there could be purposes here. And uh, he he says, um, let's just think about the probabilities of there being a universe in which there could be planets at all. And the answer is um, one in 10 to the 229th. Um, but it, to um, put that in perspective, as far as we know, uh, there are only 10 to the 86 um, subatomic particles in the known visible universe. So this is an astronomically large, literally astronomically large number. Um, because of course, you know, when you go from 10 to the 86 to 10 to the 87, you've multiplied it by 10 and every time up to <laughs> 229. But then Eugene Koonin talks about the, the difficulty of life coming about. And, and Eugene Koonin is um, an absolutely mainstream government um, scientist. And he points out that there is a very difficult problem involved because for life, there must be faithful transcription. Um, 
But for facial transcription, there need to be highly evolved proteins. Yeah. But for those highly evolved proteins, there needs already to be facial transcription. And so there appears to be a chicken and egg situation. And he says, let us imagine how likely it would be for a molecule of uh, mRNA to be brought into being and to be able to start the process of life. And he, he estimates it. Uh, the figure I've got in mind is one chance in 10 to the 1,108. Remember, the, the number of particles in the known universe is 10 to the 86. But this is 10 to the 1,108. In other words, effectively impossible. Mm -hmm. And yet he says it did happen. Um, and he is very defensive immediately after saying this. He said it doesn't imply teleology, not at all. Because teleology is not science. And I, I say, well, yes, teleology is not science. Teleology is philosophy. And you've got to have a philosophical approach to what it is we're looking at. Something extraordinary is happening. And the only way out of it is, again, this infinite number of universes. Yes. Yes, and the surrogate is teleonomy. And, and some people are flirting with the idea so much that it sounds like teleology, but they're just saying teleonomy. Yes, yes. Well, that little, it reminds me slightly of the, of the progress of certain words which have become unfashionable or thought incorrect, and another one is substituted, and quite soon that one becomes uh, unfashionable and incorrect, and so we carry on. But it, it, people were terribly upset by teleology, so they decided to invent teleonomy, but frankly, it's teleology by any other name. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the, that thing that, that sounds like a dark and moves like a duck and that's all the things like a duck <laughs> nevertheless we, we'll continue to making making the proviso that it's probably not a duck right <laughs> <laughs> well, well since we since this chapter is entitled the nature of the cosmos purpose life and the nature of the cosmos let me ask you something that was spurred by again this emphasis you made about life speeding things up and it has come in other chapters but but since we're also working through resonances here i'll ask it again mm. It hmm. sounds to me, it sounded to me this last time you mentioned that speeding up, that what's going on in the cosmos? Is that some sort of cosmic urgency or impatience? Why this speeding up? A very, very good question. Um, and immediately I think of your idea, when you say urgency, of desire. Hmm. Why, if it is true that whatever this primal force of creativity is, that it is it's purposing to bring things into being, to find out about itself, to have an object with which it can have a relationship, or to put it in completely non-scientific terms, that it has the nature of love about it, mm. then there is a degree of desire, a degree of urgency in it to see this happen, to bring it about. And if that purpose doesn't need to be delayed and isn't better for being delayed, why not let us go and bring it about? So, uh, yes, um, that is a very anthropomorphic way of thinking, but then Anthropomorphism is not a problem for me. It's a problem for the reductionists and the materialists. <laughs> yes, I was having two very vivid anthropomorphized images of two lovers undressing themselves with a sense of urgency, with that <laughs> desire, and also a key just opening a present. It's not going to yes. open it slowly because the present is there and, you know, why rush? It's like, well, yes. I want to see what's yes. going on in there. <laughs> Yes, yes, that's that's it's good. Desire and urgency, yes, yes. And but it is it is reasonable to think of the creative process as urgent. Mm -hmm. I mean I've experienced it as such. Not that yeah. it means it takes a short time, but just that it demands to be listened to, to be um to have its ends brought about. Yes, yes. And and also if I may I had a footnote here, but it's, I think maybe an important one. Some yogis, and I'm I'm thinking of Sri Aurobindo, which we mentioned, and the mother, his spiritual partner, they were speaking about the sunlit path in a way of doing it the hard way or doing it the, the, the easy and, and, and joyful way of when, when speaking about the evolution of, of the cosmos mm -hmm. and the human being. And it's like, okay, we can just mm -hmm. take forever, but maybe it's going to be very painful, or we can just, you know, 
get our act together and just go for it in a more deliberate and speed up sped up manner uh, because that's yes that's yes. in a way what this urgency of the cosmos seems to be seems to be imparting as, as a rhythm okay let's go for it but we if we linger and we we're there hanging around okay well it may take more time fine but maybe it's more painful at the same time well just a thought yes yes well if creativity is as i have suggested throughout both a process of discovery and of self-discovery so the creator is discovering him or herself as well as the object that's being uncovered and mm -hmm. um, then this process again coming back to whitehead is a a, a duologue or a dialogue or a, a, an intercourse if you like between this mm -hmm. uh, spirit that creates and what is being created mm -hmm. and both the fact of becoming more of seeing oneself being um, created and this other that can respond coming into being one cannot imagine anything more wonderful beautiful and urgent than this process it would be like a wonderful dance or indeed an encounter between two lovers i i, I wouldn't reject your 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 image there i we have to think creatively about mm. what it is we're mm. thinking about let me move on to another point. You you more or less make in passing, but for me it was it's very relevant also because I, I had been re reading Tanguilem, the French historian and philosopher of biology and medicine. You understand? Yep. So you understand when I when I when I read your quote, so you write, any path of free creation not only will but must err. This is fascinating. Yes. This is fascinating. The idea in all this story, it's not a Hollywood movie. You know, there is error. Mm, yes, and yes. It's, it's, it's intrinsic, yes. essential. And, and Kangilem yes. says that what's proper of life, it's, it's capacity and even necessity for error. Yes. And it captures this all important idea that it is a free entity. If it is a free entity, and, you know, I think this so much is at the core of both the, the science and the philosophy here, that this whatever it is, this other that is coming into being is not wholly determined. Mm -hmm. it, it is free. And if there is freedom, there is freedom to go wrong as well as to go right. And to, in order to produce a creative result, there must be some that are not, that are discarded. This is like learning how to make a very beautiful vessel on a potter's wheel. Mm -hmm. To begin with, you make it and it's, it's not working. And then you have to find out how it does. Eventually, you find the one that does. And of course, that's all happening at split second speed in, in nature. So, yes. and it's also happening at a longer speed. It depends what you're looking at, but that things work and then are abandoned, and then that gives way to something that works better still, and so on. This is called evolution, and evolution depends on both error and success. You, you can't have just error without success, and you can't have just success without error. In either case, you won't have a creating and creative cosmos. Yes. And also it has religious undertones, which, which I, I, I dare to mention here, right? Because the, the idea of sin, I like to think of it as yes. missing, missing the target. Well, shoot again. Yes. No problem. I mean, we're yes. practicing. Just try again. Yes. And that's, that's on, ongoing. It's work in process. No problem. I, I, I have to admit that the same analogy came to me too, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, there's a section in this chapter entitled, and I would like you to... You know, it's explicated a bit. Warning, purpose may damage your health. <laughs> yes. Um, I, think, I think, again, um, it's interesting, isn't it? I find myself often saying what I was trying to dissociate myself from or what I was trying to fend off was. So often the process of arriving at truth is this apophatic path. It's not this that you must jump to the mm. conclusion I'm saying. It's not this that you must think I'm saying. And so, um, and yet I hope I am saying positively things that I do think are the case. But here all I, I was really doing was addressing myself to the idea that, um, and it, it follows on quite nicely from what we've just been talking about, that all developments that look purposive are going to be ones that we think are um, beneficial, that the look like um, benign creations. Many of these don't look that benign. So there are parts of this picture which mm. can be very far from benign, even though the overall 
drive of it may be benign. You can't, you can't invalidate the overall picture by details, but some of the details, and I pick out a few of the really um, gross ones. <laughs> Actually, the one that interests me most and that I came across first was through being interested in schizophrenia. And there is a theory um, that uh, there's quite a, quite a good amount of, um, uh, of scientific um, research that supports it, a theory uh, by Fulatori, who is an American biologist, that schizophrenia is caused by uh, Toxoplasma gondii. And Toxoplasma gondii is um, something that infects rats. Um, but to complete its life cycle, it needs to get into cats. And the difficulty for it is that um, rats are quite good at escaping from cats. But it manages, when it's in the rat, to modify the behavior of the host rat, such that instead of fleeing from cats, it positively seeks them out. So it approaches cats fearlessly. And then, of course, the cat kills it and eats it. And the toxoplasma uh, purpose has been fulfilled because now it's into the cat. The further stage is that he, for various reasons, and I don't, I don't really want to go into great detail, but are fascinating to do with the domestication of cats um, in ancient Egypt, then the relative absence from households in Europe until around the 18th century when they started to be not just in the corner of the farmyard, but actually pets living with humans, that um, interestingly, this also parallels things to do with the time course of schizophrenia. So um, obviously not a benign outcome, uh, uh, but it is fascinating that the parasite here very determinedly changes the nature of the behavior of the host. And probably the most dramatic one is I think fairly well known now um, is the case of the carpenter ant. The carpenter ant is a very sophisticated creature um, it both carves wooden galleries in which to uh, make its nests and in which to create farms. So it farms aphids uh, for a green sticky substance, a milk that they produce that it likes. It, it, it milks the and uh, milks the aphids by stroking them with its antennae and receiving this nourishing <laughs> milk. So it's a very sophisticated creature in itself, but it falls prey to the zombie ant fungus, yeah. which is a, a seriously evil entity. <laughs> the, 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 the zombie ant fungus, um, if ingested by the ant, immediately alters the behavior of the ant to make it do something that no, ordinarily it would never do. Ordinarily, the ant lives on the forest floor. But when it's infected, the ant then decides to climb a tree, mm. uh, not because this is good for the ant, but because this is good for the fungus. And it climbs it always to about the same height. I think it's something like 25 centimeters up the, uh, the bole of the tree. And then it does something else, which is entirely foreign to its nature, which is to clasp a vein of the leaf that's present at around that point in its mandibles and hang there. And soon um, a, a spore shoots out of the head of the, of the poor ant, which dies, and these fungi fall onto the forest floor where they infect more ants. So this is a highly sophisticated, mm -hmm. swift-moving, malignant um, survival mechanism that um, has been evolved. So I just wanted to get away from the idea that there's anything necessarily cozy about this. Yes, we could call them, or I would call them, the bad trips of evolution. The bad trips, yes, and yes, And they stand right. from these incredible biological examples to human history itself, which is mm. perhaps a more serious mm. matter. Why, why did we do what we did? Well, we weren't there, but what, what do, what do, why do humans do the horrendous things we do? Mm. Um, and of course, again, some people will say, well, stop anthropomorphizing from, from nature and so on, or even giving this kind of grand sense of, of, of history. But if we want to think in, in true evolutionary terms, well, it's at least, I would say, important, even useful to try to conceive 
the grand narrative, like what's what's going on and, and why do these kind of going forward and backwards and, and diversions and coming backs and dead ends, why are they happening? Mm, mm. Mm. Well, there isn't obviously ultimately a single answer to that, mm. but I think we need to bear in mind these different strands of a kind of purpose, which is not the instrumental purpose, but that at times manifest for short-term goals in terms of extrinsic purpose. Um, but overall is um, brought uh, to fruition through the combination of, this sounds like other things I've said, the, the combination of cooperation with competition. And I call that combination collaboration. So in nature, there is competition, which is what we've all heard about for years. But there is also collaboration. And of the two, collaboration is much more important. But it involves also an element of competition. And those two together are collaboration. And that's how evolution has taken huge steps forward. By beings, yes, occasionally deciding to parasite us and or another creature and kill it, but much, much more often to to sort of get together with that creature and achieve common goals. And one of the most stunning um, examples of this surely has to be within um, the mammalian body and, and the human body, that there are so many organisms, cells that are part of our immune system, uh, and many cells, well, all cells really, in the end started off as single cells. They decided to club together as part of multicellular beings. And eventually um, there are in cells bacteria that gave up their independence to become parts of the cell, mitochondria. And there are cells that, billions and trillions of cells in our body whose job is to protect the overall um, integrity of the body as a whole, but may in doing so be self-sacrificial creatures that, you know, in, in engorging um, a, an enemy, uh, uh, it, it, will, it will die, but it does it anyway. So again, you have nestings of purposes, some of them selfish, some of them selfless. And it, it's surely got to be this dynamic of not the one nor the other, but the the coming together of the two. Yes. That it, 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 everywhere I look in this story, that is the thing that needs to be held on to. That's the melody and the smell of your book and your argument, actually, all along. Yes. So, or, or the or the ground base, the the the, the <laughs> or the yes, cancer sperm, yes. 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 Anyway, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. I, I wanted to come back to God. God as an engineer. God as a mathematician. And also, you mentioned naive deism. Yes. Yes. Can you unpack okay. these two? Because because I find it so interesting yes. that in, in rejecting God, and um, some provinces of science end up. Uh, daring themselves to to weird, maybe naive conceptions yes. of God. Like it's like, well, why not stay with the original? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And when we do come to talk about God, which we will, um, I, I will suggest that uh, there are certain types of believers and certain types of atheists who are extremely similar to one another. Anyway, what, what, sticking with what you've just asked, it's probably worth just mentioning. That there is a convention whereby um, the word deism from the Latin root deus for God is separated from theism from the Greek word theos for God. And in theism, we're just covering all um, religious belief systems, all those that include a God. But in deism, we're talking about something very specific, time specific, um, a view that really arose in the, uh, the earliest late 17th century, but it certainly was underway in the 18th century this view of God as the divine engineer um, who oversees his machine and in various variants either intervenes or doesn't intervene. It, it, it's a very problematic idea indeed. And it's often associated with um, a bishop called Paley who, um, who, who said, look, if you're walking across 
um, some open land, more land, and, and, and on the ground you see a watch. You've never seen a watch before. You pick it up and you look at it. If you look at it, you will assume there is a watchmaker because this can't just have come together like this by chance. And so he used that argument um, to put forward the view that there must be a god. Interesting, Richard Dawkins calls himself a kind of um, a neo paleist because he sees um, this same business of the mechanism being generated. It's just that he doesn't see it being generated by a god. So really what he's done is take Paley's all-seeing god, put his eyes out, and adopted him, it, whatever it is, this thing behind everything that just drives a machine forward. And so th th that's uh, th the interesting thing is that it, it, what separates people is not perhaps whether this thing is thought of as divine or not, because arguably you could say whatever it is that Richard Dawkins has in mind that can do all these amazing things um, may have many of the qualities that we would normally associate with the, the divine, certainly the superhuman. Um, it's not the distinction between is there a God or there isn't, but whether there is a free um, reciprocal cooperative coming together of opposites to achieve something more complex and more beautiful, but that is fundamentally undetermined. It's between that position and the one where there is just blind machinery, which is uh, pushing forward. It knows not where, we know not where, and we are the playthings of that machinery. Now, these are very, very different pictures of the cosmos. Yes. And they have, they have not only um, consequences for uh, fulfillment as human beings, but they have moral consequences. So we know that people who have a deterministic view tend to make less moral decisions. They also tend to um, be more despairing, to um, have less creative initiative, because after all, if everything is determined, why really would you bother? Why not just um, sit back, watch a movie, um, eat a burger, drink a six pack, and, ho and hope that you'll die quite soon. But I, I'm, of course, parodying, but there is extremely good research that shows that people who are deterministic are less happy, less productive, and make less moral decisions. So it does matter how you think. Again, as we think, we live. Yes. Let me ask you one more, and if, if this comes into the terrain of the following chapter, the last chapter, The Sense of the Sacred, well, you can either pass or summarize. But I'm curious, so this naive neo -deism, is this kind of a blunt attempt to naturalize theism? Is this a way to secularize the sacred? I mean, what's the alchemy attempted here mm. in these moves? Yes, yes. Well, you raise a very, very interesting question, and I suppose the answer must be that there are different motivations at work, certainly for different people. But one of the things one sees is that certain conclusions, although more economical and more probable than their alternatives, are simply so unthinkable to certain groups of people that they'd rather adopt the less reasonable, the less probable outcome. Uh, so, uh, for example, it really wouldn't be that difficult to take the step and say, I think there could be a drive in the universe. It looks like there is one. All the evidence seems to suggest there is one. Why not just say, yes, there is one? The alternative is to say, no, there isn't. It just looks like one because this just happens to be the universe in which everything has worked out to exactly the right decimal point to allow everything to come into existence. And that is a much, much less probable as well as a less rational conclusion. I say less rational because it it produces the end of reasoning when you can say, well, anything can happen. Uh, you know, ya boo sucks, I'm right. Then there is no discussion to be had. You can't do science, you can't do reason. So it's less reasonable, it's less profitable, it's highly more improbable. Why is it so impossible that there could be a purpose 
in the cosmos. We see purposes in, as a natural part of experience. Why deny it to the cosmos? Mm -hmm. And I think it's because there's a kind of hubris in the... It was there, in, in, in essence, in the Enlightenment, but it's been taken very much further in the couple of centuries, or three centuries since then, which is that we somehow must be the creators of it, the understanders of it. There can't be something else that is above us, that stands above us, that is broader in its vision, that is more profound, that is more seeing than we are because somehow that is conceived of as diminution. But it was only diminution if you are, you know, putting yourself up as a hero that is in contrast with, with that divine whatever it is. Yeah. If instead of seeing it as, you know, in competition, and therefore a diminution for you, you see it as collaboration that you have been brought about as part of this process and that you are to share in this extraordinary adventure, yes. then it, it doesn't have this demeaning effect on the self-respect of the human being. I, I, I've said already in the Master and His Emissary, you know, awe, the sense of awe, the sense of smallness we feel before something magnificent is not a, not a negative feeling. It's not a feeling of being put down in some way. In fact, it's an exhilarating feeling in which we see that we are part of something much greater than ourselves. Now, if we can see that, we can actually accept it, rejoice in it. As long as we go on with the mindset that we cannot afford to have anything that sees more or knows more than we are in our world picture, then we are the unhappy, um, unsatisfied um, people who hold to reductionist materialism and have nothing really to say about any possible meaning or purpose in the cosmos and to them goodness and beauty and truth are a bit of a mystery well that's a great um wrapping up of this session an invitation for the following one because as, as you're speaking it's very clear to me that recovering the sense of the sacred is both the assignment and also perhaps the symptom that that we are looking at the world from these other well, having this other take on the world that, that your whole book is about. Yes, yes. Well, thank you. That's that's part of the the way this thing seems to be turning out to go, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a bit like Pushkin, you know, who said it's right at the very end of his masterwork, Yevgeny Onegin, you know, when I started, I had no idea where this journey was going to lead me. But then I had only dim visions in a, in a sort of crystal ball. And then now this thing has come to be what it is. And I didn't know. And it did happen. I feel that very, very much about the process of writing this book and where it's, where it's taken me. And I hope we'll take some viewers, listeners, readers. Well, as a reader, I can tell you this is literally uh, what happened to me. I didn't know where we were going with this. And um, this journey has been <laughs> revealing <laughs> its destination in a very beautiful way as we as we enjoyed the journey. Yes, I hope it, 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 it has made sense that, as it were, the thing has gradually unfolded. Um, so, yeah. Totally, yes. Good, good. Okay. Well, that's excellent. Thank you very much, Alex. So there's um, chapter 28 to come. There we are. All right. Until then. Well, we'll get together for that one soon, I'm sure. Yes. Okay. Goodbye. Okay. Bye-bye.